Hello everyone and welcome back to Quick Flicks and today we're talking about the Eastern Oregon Film Festival for 2021. Now I do this every year mostly because I like to talk about small filmmakers and while I don't necessarily have access to every film festival ever made, there is one that's conveniently in the next town over that I get to talk about. Similar to last year where most if not all of the films were put online, this year was mostly the same. They had a sort of virtual ticket passing and we were allowed to watch at least 99% of the films at home. There was one film, however, that was in person and I did get to go see that uh, the other day and uh, I'll talk about that one in a minute. Going to see some of these films in person, it definitely is a different experience uh, considering the fact that this year we had to do mask mandates, we had to do you know, we had to make sure that there wasn't a huge lot of people that were going to this because in the past, these things usually are a little bit bigger, but I did notice that there was a huge decline in how many people were going. And that's because most of the offerings were, you know, for home viewing and, you know, members could go in person, but they could also watch all of the slate except for one online, uh, which is pretty fine, I guess. And for what we did, for what I did get to see in person, um, it was pretty fun. Um, and certain viewings, you know, it made me feel like I was kind of home again. Just a little bit. But yeah, so this year there were 12 feature films and there were two that I did not get to see. Uh, the first one is Strawberry Mansion. Now, if you've already known, I've already reviewed this film for Sundance and... Um, I definitely recommended it, and I kind of knew at that point that EOFF was going to pick that one up as a screening, and I was right. And the other film I didn't get around to seeing was the Green pa uh, Green Basin Pasture or something like that. Uh, it's a documentary, and I didn't get to see it mostly because the streamer didn't apparently wasn't wanting to play the film. It was playing the trailer constantly. So out of the 12 films, I have seen 10 of them. So I'll just say I got 100% mostly. So yeah, we're going to start off with the films that I saw first, and we're going to go to the latest. So the first film I decided to watch at home was Night at the Eagle Inn. This is the third film I've seen from Eric Blomquist. His previous films were Long Lost and um, uh, the 10 Minutes to Midnight with Barbara Crampton and... Those two films were pretty fine. I liked them. They were fun little comedies slash horror type stuff. And the, Eric Blomquist once again brings comedy and horror to it in a new kind of fashion. So a brother and sister go to the Eagle Inn, which is uh, an inn where they were born at, but they were also trying to figure out where the father went because they figured that he went to this hotel. And once they sign the guest book, all hell kind of breaks loose for them. Like, they start seeing things left and right. The hotel is playing with them. They try escaping, and, you know, there's some things that happen. And it's pretty much a little supernatural sort of horror short film. It's not really a short film. It runs at about 70-something minutes. And for that runtime, it doesn't necessarily overstay its welcome. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit more uh, closure to some of the storylines because it does feel like it's a pilot episode of a series to me um, considering how it ends but I do like the dynamic between the brother and sister in this film and the mystery surrounding the hotel is honestly pretty fun and one of the actors in this film gave a really fun performance towards the end as somewhat of a devil type person who signs deals um, I'm not necessarily going to say who or what because it's a funny reveal um, but I will say it's kind of predictable just a little bit but suffice to say, Night, Night of the Eagle Inn, it's a fun time for 70-something minutes. I would like to see Shudder or Crypt TV pick it up as a series, you know? If you're watching Eric, try, try making this one a series. I want to see more exploration of this. I want to see what happens next to these two people. Like, seriously, you end it on such a weird ending, and I would love to see more of it. And so the next film I watched online was The Bitter Taste of Ginger. Now this film, uh, I, I don't know what to make of this film. This film is the weirdest, like, you know, there's always that one film every year that EOFF loves to put in just to fuck with me, I feel. Because it's just, 
hey, look at this film. Isn't this film, like, weird? And it definitely is weird. So the plot synopsis for this one is that there's a woman who has an asphyxiation kink who is trying to build up the courage to kill her mom. But the problem is that the film has a weird non-linear storytelling sort of bit. So the whole point of her trying to kill her mom doesn't even come until halfway through the movie. And by then I've kind of checked out because prior to that point, it's a lot of nonsense. Like to me, I just couldn't really get into it. It just felt like a Dadaist type of film. And I know there will be people that, like, are gravitated towards this type of nonsensical storytelling and weird fourth wall breaks. And, you know, good for them. At least you found a film that uh, is for you. But personally, I did not like it. And then next up is the first film I saw for the next day of the festival. And that is The Dirt Whisperer. This is a documentary that follows a... Uh, a man who used to work for the corporate world but now wants to make his own farm and he talks about soil science and honestly it's not that bad of a documentary it's well produced it has good audio great talking head moments um, has some decent cinematography good graphics um, and it talks a little bit about how you know big corporations you know don't necessarily do a good job in terms of agriculture science and honestly, I think this film would be really best suited for people who are really interested in agriculture science because he does talk a little bit about uh, what makes great compost, what makes, you know, good soil to make the best enriching foods. Um, and honestly, it's a pretty inspiring little movie and it might generate a lot of interest in people wanting to make their own little micro farms so then that way they can, you know, have food at their dinner table without having to go to the grocery store. Uh, which is pretty topical at the moment. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend this one to people who are interested in agriculture sciences or people who want to change their lifestyle. And so from there, I went to the EOFF uh, in person. They were showing all these films um, at the Eastern Oregon University Theater just to kind of condense a lot of the audience. They didn't want them like, you know, walking around too often. So they kept it all in Mackenzie Theater, or at least in that area. And the first feature film I saw there was Attic Trunk. Attic Trunk is a 74-minute film that feels like it's two hours long. I, I have a serious problem with this film. I think pacing-wise, it is not good. I get wanting to ruminate on a lot of the themes of the film, such as how we process different types of grief, uh, the mistakes we've made you know, uh, the memories we share in our relationships. Like, it's it's a fine little movie that has some heart, but I feel like, you know, I definitely felt in the audience that the film was kind of lulling people, just like, like the pacing wasn't so good in this movie. Um, it could have used some better, like, pacing or something more interesting happening, um, but I do think this should have been best suited for like a short film and not a 74 minute film. Um, it's not that. It does have a good emotional core and it does have a pretty decent story. But at the end of the day, it just wasn't interesting to me. And honestly, that's kind of a shame because it does have a good emotional core that I wish was better utilized. And so the next film is kind of the opposite of this where... It's 76 minutes long, and it's a film called See You Soon. Uh, this is basically a movie about two people who get back together after 10 plus years, um, one having gone through a transition, uh, and the other one having to struggle with some art that she has been trying to do for so long. And both of them have this really great conversation piece. You know, uh, all the time in this movie, they're communicating what they've done, what they wish they would do. Um, what their experiences are like, the differences between what a woman does and what a trans woman does. Um, it's pretty interesting. This is by a director who is trans. And, you know, I think one of the biggest key, oh, some of the biggest key words I have that is in pertaining to this festival are two big ones, relationships and LGBT themes, right? Because most of these movies have some variation of the types of relationships we share plus LGBT relationships. And for this one, we have uh, a trans woman who, uh, who meets up with her former friend 
from college and they spend the entire night together. And the thing is, is that the writer of this movie, they did a really good job in really hooking the viewer. Like there's a lot of really fun conversations, some that have some comedic roots and some point to a lot of deeper cuts. And there's this really great cr uh, climax in this art warehouse where both of them have had their wits end and they're arguing with each other about a certain topic, which I'm not going to divulge because it's, it's a pretty big part of the movie. And uh, yeah, let's just say I was pretty much arrested at that point because it was just so good. And the performances in this movie are some of the best I've seen out of the festival because there's just such intensity into what both of the people are believing, what both characters are believing and what they both stand for. And it's really good. Um, this is from uh, Vanishing Angle, and apparently they have a distribution for some time next year. So if you want to check out See You Soon, definitely check it out. Support trans filmmakers, and we'll get on to the next film. And so now we have the headline film of the entire festival. The one film that they had to put in as an in-person only viewing, and that is Jim Cummings' The Beta Test. Now, the beta test is very different than uh, some of the other Jim Cummings films. There's some DNA that's still there from Thunder Road and Wolf of Snow Hollow in that, you know, Jim Cummings still plays kind of an awkward, you know, type of person. But this time he's a little bit more like, it's a little bit more intense this time around. There's still the, the times of awkward humor and some misunderstandings, you know, that's kind of the DNA of comedy. But it's more rooted in this sort of sexual thriller type thing. So the plot of this movie revolves around Jim as he's kind of a big Hollywood agent that's trying to get packages to people um, and it's kind of a dying business and he gets wrapped up in this whole thing where he gets a purple envelope that says you know hey if you want a night of anonymous sex with someone uh, that you don't really know you know hey here you go and from there he's trying to figure out who the person was because he made a mistake of looking at who it was. And so the entire film really plays off the idea of algorithms in real life and how that can complicate even, you know, normal relationships. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting for the most part. I don't think it's necessarily perfect. There's some moments where I was kind of like, uh, do I really like this? It's, I mean, it's fine. But a lot of the times, I think the performances are really well handled. I think the character work is really good. Uh, it definitely had some really good reactions from the audience that I saw it with, especially with the opening sequence where there is something that happens and it was so quick. It's, it's something that's not really played up as a horrifying moment. It just happens. And I definitely heard like a huge audible gasp from like most of the audience in that first like 15 minutes of the film. And the film itself is not necessarily like a bad film. I think it's really good. I don't think it's as good as Thunder Road, but I do think it's a pretty fun little movie that's like Eyes Wide Shut, but in the modern day with Social Network, right? You mix Eyes Wide Shut with the Social Network, bam, there you go. There's your movie, and I think it was pretty well handled for the most part. Oh, and also, with the beta test, it comes out November 5th for wide distribution, so if you want to see the beta test, uh, definitely go check it out at that point. I got to see it early, so um, yeah, here's a recommendation from me. And so my final day of the festival, I saw five feature films. So we'll start with the first one, and that is Everything in the End. Everything in the End takes place in Iceland, where you have a Portuguese man who, do who doesn't necessarily want to return home, but experiences the lives of others during the end of the world. And this takes place during the, the moments leading up to the end of the world, where this main character is just going around the different people, and you're finding out little bits and pieces about who these people are and how they're reacting to the news that the world is going to end. And it's, at times, pretty emotional. This is a very contemplative and very slow little film. It's only 74 minutes, 74, 75 minutes long, but it's a really f nice look into a very humanitarian type of movie. It's a movie that delves deeper into how people would react how people would, would not really react. And it's a film that is, again, contemplative. I think the performances here are really good. Um, and it really is a pretty fun little film about, well, the end of the world. Don't expect big explosions or anything. 
the whole point of this movie is to understand people and how they're reacting to like everything so yeah give it a watch if you can find it um it's mostly in english and uh i think i think one of the things i had a problem with though is uh there was no subtitles for uh for people who are speaking icelandic uh or even other languages um so that might be the fault of the film festival because the film itself didn't really have any subtitles keep in mind most of it is in in english but for times where it had some you know icelandic or portuguese i would have liked some you know some subtext right i would have liked some subtitles to understand a little bit more about what was going on what people are saying so yeah so that's just my one little critique i had of it the next film i saw is a really weird one and that is hello from nowhere this is a semi-musical semi-comedy film about a group of people who go into the mountains and uh and they come across a guy who um is kind of good natured at first but he has ulterior motives about what he wants to do with the group and it's this it's sort of this like relationship type comedy and some weird music stuff i i i don't know this movie is just really weird for me and i don't know if i really like it but it definitely has some entertaining performances i guess and Although I'm not necessarily a big fan of the music, so that's kind of a negative on my part. But that's just subjective, right? That's just what I think. I know some people might like it, so I'll just leave it there. So the next film I saw was Kendra and Beth. And this film follows Beth as she works in a sausage warehouse packaging distribution thing. She has to take care of her mom. She has to take care of her older brother um, who had some sort of accident. Um, and she comes across a woman named Kendra who starts, you know, bringing some life back into her life. And this film is really great. I think it's a nice little romantic comedy film with some dark humor here and there. Uh, there's a, there's this really great di dinner scene towards the middle of the movie with, where Kendra meets the family for the first time. And it was so great. There were so many funny, awkward moments, and there were so many great lines of dialogue that... Honestly, it's just hilarious, and it does have a nice little heart at its core, and I just I just really like this one. I think the character work is really good. I think the actress who plays Beth does a really amazing job. Uh, same thing as Kendra and everyone else. Um, I really like the older brother, mostly because he makes a sculpture out of Lego, and I found the result of that sculpture was really kind of hilarious and dark, but... Uh, yeah, I think Kendra Beth was probably one of the better films of the festival. So, yeah, check it out if you can. I don't know where else you can find it, but yeah. So my second to last film I saw was Sapolo, which is a documentary about a island off the coast of Georgia that is a community primarily full of people of color. Uh, this was an area that was, um, that was, you know, the land that former slaves made into their own community. And this is a film that, you know, shares that sort of like that community aspect and what the community is going through, what they are trying to do, and some of the struggles they've been having with some of their own island residents. Um, and it's a pretty nice little documentary about this group of people that uh, try to make best with what they have and what they want to accomplish with the area. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little hour and a half documentary. And if you're interested, there you go. And so the last film I saw was Vinyl Nation. Now, if you know me, I have a pretty decent sized vinyl collection. I mean, I don't have a lot of vinyls, but I do have some that I really love. And uh, some of them are Christmas vinyl albums. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I have like six vinyl albums that are Christmas songs. Uh, <laughs> I know. I'm a, I'm a sadist. But what Vinyl Nation is about is the resurgence of vinyl. It examines the culture of vinyl. Uh, through the lens of pop culture, what people are getting out of vinyl nowadays, why is it making a resurgence, what was the culture like before the resurgence, and it also shows off some of the new investments and developments in vinyl technology um, and the love of vinyl. It's a very heartfelt, loving tribute to vinyl, um, and it examines a lot of, uh, of vinyl culture, why people are still buying vinyl when a lot of people are you know doing Spotify and Apple Music and there is a pretty good uh, good argument for why that is in the movie I'm not gonna 
describe it here because it's actually a pretty good moment. If it's one thing that I had a kind of a problem with with Vinyl Nation is that I think it's a little bit too long. There's some redundancies I found with this film where they kept going to a lot of these sort of like big record fairs and record like conventions. And I would have liked to have seen those segments like cut down just a little bit. Maybe focus on one or two and not like a bunch. Um, it would have like, you know, had a little bit of a better pace. I just found that that, that section alone was maybe a little bit too long. Uh, but other than that, I do think Vinyl Nation is a pretty fun film for music fans, vinyl collectors. Um, it's a documentary that I might watch again. Um, it's pretty informative. It's well produced. And that's all I can really say about Vinyl Nation. And those are the films I saw at the Eastern Oregon Film Festival. Honestly, the selection this year was actually really good. There were some films that weren't necessarily great. Uh, some that I was kind of like iffy about. But if I was to pick my top five in no particular order of the festival, it would be The Beta Test, uh, Everything in the End, Kendra and Beth, See You Soon, and Vinyl Nation. I think those are really good films that you should check out. And that's all I have for you today. So now I have to get back to work on the final episode of Stephen King Month. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.